The topic is design in India, digital twin and virtual validation, the importance of these two aspects which is emerging. We have seen the presentation just now by Rashmi uh, that has already given a good peek about uh, virtual validation or the virtual testing that we do now to reduce the time to market a product. The life cycle of the product has reduced drastically and that is very important for this dynamic market situation also. So uh, since the back room of the automobile industry is component industry, they are the people, they start designing the product or developing the product that finally comes to the OEM and then the product rolls out. So Deepak, I would like to hear from you what does design in India mean to you right now and how much of virtual validation or testing, how much of the software is now being used and what are the areas where you have been able to improve in terms of time to develop, in terms to time to market a product by using virtual technologies? Thank you, Nabil, for, <clears throat> thank you, Nabil, for having me over. Also, thank you for setting me very strategically towards extreme less because all my customers on the right, so customers always right. You told me already. <laughs> you also did mention that the component guys are the backbone. But I think in a sense, when you talk about design, you talk about validation, eventually we are producing for the end product result, which is the end consumer. And there has to be extreme collaboration alignment with what our customer needs are. When it basically comes of what you asked, what making design means for India. I think when we are talking at a larger plethora, manufacturing in India cannot be complete until unless there is a design element, there is an engineering element. I will not call it R&D because research has a very different meaning, but D&D as well as engineering takes us because we are eventually manufacturing an engineered product. Now, as a supply chain, I think first there is various models. There is a build to print model. There is a model which you can call as a reverse engineered, which is already proven in other markets. But then there are now, which is in a very competitive India market, models which are coming in, which are made for India or at a global level. And they are concurrent engineering. And for that, I think the engineering resources needs to be stepped up in the component industry. And this I'm talking about is the current model per se. However, there is another advent where engineering takes a very different meaning, and that's technology. We have all seen in the morning sessions how technology landscape is changing. And I think there, the components have very different, different models like collaborations, joint ventures, or how do we source this technology so that we are able to do this. Virtual validation, all that, these are kind of tools, but the bigger picture is that we need to be completely aligned with the customers to ensure that we have a first time good quality engineered product. Alan, uh, uh, Raman San, you represent India's largest car manufacturer in the country. Uh, Maruti, despite being leader, I think there are two products that has been locally designed under your leadership. Uh, how do you see this uh, design in India progressing in, in, in the country right now? What are the challenges? We are over 100 year old industry right now in India. But still we have a lot of, uh, you know, technology being imported or being sourced from the partner and the TA, technical alliance and all that. And we lose out on the commercial aspect because of this. So how do you see this? What are, where are we missing? Well, uh, so good afternoon, everybody, and thank you, uh, uh, Nabil San, uh, uh, for having me here. And uh, uh, so, my take is a little different on this uh, as far as design in India is concerned. I believe that there was a time when we were, you know, getting technology and we were uh, all looking at how we can manufacture products in India. Uh, today, and the reason why R&D or a design or application was not happening was because of the lack of scale. And today, India has the opportunity uh, to uh, provide that scale uh, for doing application-related work, engineering-related work, design-related work uh, in India. That's number one. Number two, we are already the fourth largest uh, 
passenger car manufacturer in the world. We are going to become number three in the next three to four years. Our customers are looking at technology and solutions uh, which are relevant and which are uh, available uh, in the rest of the world. And so it's important that as manufacturers, how we can provide them that design, that technology, uh, that requirement, how we can meet that in India locally so that we can make it affordable. Because that's one of the challenges for India, that India, the customer is very cost conscious. And so that's something which is very important and therefore design in India is very, very relevant. Uh, and going forward, I think the other thing which I see is harnessing of the engineering talent in India is I think the third key factor which is going to, uh, you know, be an opportunity to meet this, you know, challenge which we are going to see in the next 10 years the mega trends which must have been discussed in the morning sessions. Uh, this engineering talent which is available in India, I think is today working for uh, many global organizations already. And many other companies are going to set up uh, this uh, in India. And so therefore, I think that's a huge, uh, uh, you know, uh, challenge or uh, huge opportunity for the engineering talent and we should be able to harness that. So I think it's important that uh, we look at all these aspects when we are, you know, considering uh, 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 design in India and uh, and the last part is what uh, Deepak Sarn talked about was about ability of suppliers to develop technology because as OEMs we do application and we, uh, you know, incorporate it into the vehicle how the component industry is able to also uh, dovetail the effort, collaborate, co-create along with the OEMs uh, to do design in India, I think is going to be the way forward. And there's a huge opportunity, which I believe, uh, which you can further talk about. Thank you, uh, Raman sir. Uh, Rajiv, you represent a company that comes from a market, the parent company comes from a market which is highly competitive in terms of uh, engineering cost wise commercially how much of uh, local engineering are you doing as uh, Deepak pointed out that it is more of engineering not just design or R&D it has a very vast uh, connotation so just want to understand how easy it was to localize the engineering and how were you able to convince or how are you convinced on your commercial aspect when you look at localizing the product or engineer. Nabil was kind enough not to introduce me as the guy from one of the smallest companies because he's the biggest company, Raman, and I'm one of the smallest companies, MG. Uh, but nice of you to not to say that way. Uh, so yeah, uh, so uh, as you know, MG is a British brand owned by Chinese. So you're talking about the Chinese cost here. In, um, uh, so the thing is, uh, this is this is pretty interesting. You know, when you and I am old enough uh, to say here that I've been associated with a lot of uh, different nationality cars here. So right from Opel Astra to some of the Japanese cars and Korean cars, we localized here. And usually the assumption used to be that our Indian cost is going to be 15 to 20% lower than them, A to A, apple to apple cost basis. Whereas when you try to localize from China, in certain categories still we save 5 to 8%, in certain categories we are 30%, 40%, 50%, 80% costlier. So, so that's a challenge. Having said that, I'm happy and proud to say that our cost competitiveness in India is actually increasing a lot. You know, some of our cars are more than 60% localized. Uh, Hector diesel is more than 75% localized, which just imagine the cost base we are talking about, right? Uh, now, you know, the thing is, it's not only the cost, but the freight, um, VAV opportunity in India, uh, the feature rationalization in India, um, and also, you know, our smartness in doing some kind of a frugal, uh, a frugal kitting in the container. And, and all those things, uh, you know, make us pretty competitive and we are able to save some money. But still, I think there are challenges in certain areas like electronics, like sensors and radar components, lidar components. Uh, you know, even in uh, some of the mainstream uh, mainstream uh, uh, items like, as an example, you know, lamps or sunroof, uh, 
uh, you know, certain areas still we import as child components. So I think there is an opportunity to localize. Another important thing is, which I think uh, I'm happy to say, and, and we are doing it, is we are bringing some latest technology into the country. And we are trying to socialize those technologies with engineering colleges, institutes, ACMA, uh, so that we can uh, you know, reskill uh, uh, the people in, uh, in our country in various areas so that we try to localize that technology uh, fast in our country. So. Thank you, Rajiv. Uh, Deepak, the question comes to you again. We see the auto component industry largely, if you look at, we have multiple Indian, core Indian company working in this, but mostly they are SMEs. Their contribution to the overall um, uh, revenue of the industry is still not majority. Majority is owned by either joint ventures or the foreign uh, companies. After this pandemic, what has been the really reason for this, uh, you know, this kind of breakup in terms of revenue right now? And second part of the question, after the pandemic, have you seen some kind of change in terms of thought process of the Indian companies towards R&D or design in India? So, Nabil, I think the pandemic was a game changer. Um, it kind of shook us to the core. We also have to understand that in India, the industry was already in a depressed mode in a recessed mode, even before the pandemic, right? It was already there two years, and I think the pain was a little bit more. You asked me two things. One was the structure of the auto component industry. I think 50% of the revenue, and I'm talking not by numbers, but revenue, has been contributed by joint ventures. And I think this talks a lot about the Indian market structure, because there is Indian entrepreneurship and technology providers and we have created joint ventures. I remember when Maruti Suzuki got formed, uh, I think they facilitated a lot of the joint ventures and a lot of the other OEMs did that. Second, I think 20% or so is actually coming with the actual MNCs which are contributing and they may have extended joint ventures also. So 70% is this alliance. And then you also do have about 30% which are the domestic companies, and they have, they could be large companies, they could be SMEs, which are all playing in the component field. What really changed for everyone was this whole effort, first was actually the manufacturing excellence, the competitiveness. Uh, you know, it was a whole resilience part of it. There's a lot of financial prudence, which we had to do. But when it comes to technology, since we are Auto Tech Summit, I think the need to digitize the need to actually digitize the processes of workflows as well as the manufacturing. Uh, everyone had thought about 4.0. Basically, when you said that you have to create a touchless and a social distant environment, it actually just came into practice. What actually did change was the whole nature of supply chain of fabric, the whole core dependence, interdependence. And I think there, the whole policy makers have broken up. Let's not talk about globalization. Let's talk about localization. Let's talk about Atman Nirbharta. And there is where the opportunity lies, not just for India, because India has a very large market, but also from a global perspective. And I think third is the people-centric focus. I think we always were a manufacturing entity. We were customer focused. We were product focused. We were quality focused. But I think eventually people came into focus from a health safety and now from a skill perspective. So I think this was the three big attributors what pandemic shifted. We are talking about uh, digitalization or virtualization of technology. A lot of uh, automation by way of digitalization is uh, uh, taking up. But that is happening only at the large companies. Uh, do you think the affordability has become uh, more democratic for the smaller one also in India? How do you see that? So I think that's a mindset change. I don't believe this. That's only for the large companies. You know, digitization is a, you're talking about like a big ocean, blue ocean strategy. But I'll give a very specific example. On training, we also, like our OEMs tell us to have a training school within our plants. We could not meet, we could not meet. So hence we digitized training school and that's what happened to supply chain. We actually, for our tier, two, tier twos, tier threes, just on five lakh rupee basis, we can actually make a digitized training school. We have all Zoom calls, even these guys have put in. So I think engineering validation could be at probably a lot more on a tier one level, and then build to print on tier two, tier three. But I think when it talks about the culture of digitization, it's being positively adopted. Okay. Uh, Rajiv ji, you, 
your thought on how uh, you know the OEMs uh, point of view have changed after pandemic in terms of developing local uh, you know uh, supply chain not just for manufacturing but for engineering purposes also has there been some changes because the situation has really uh, erupted in such a way that people have to think local. So, so, so uh, I'll try to answer it in two parts. The first part is irrespective of COVID, irrespective of freight disruption or, or localization versus globalization. One thing is true that, you know, it makes a lot of economical sense to uh, procure the components locally because of the economic reasons. Whether you can be a, a, a Chinese-based company or Japanese or German or, uh, or Korean, uh, but I think it makes a lot of sense in a lot of components. So that way, in any case, like we are on an aggressive path of localization, and I hope we can learn something from giants like Maruti, how to really localize it. Uh, you know, uh, so, but we are on that path anyways, irrespective of any disruption. Second, because of disruption, it forces you anyway to think that, uh, listen, these kind of situations, we never imagined COVID in our life, right? But now at least, uh, you know, when you do the scenario analysis, what can go wrong? You know, this also will be always there in your mind. So, um, and also remember that we get a huge population of cars which have to be serviced through child components and, and through various servicing needs. For that, a local source always is important and good. You know, so all these things force you to go for more and more localization. I'm happy that uh, uh, with more technology, see, always we get challenged on the electronic sites and things. But the way things are changing, even in India, I'm sure in the next two to, two to three years' time frame, uh, even all the suppliers from ACMA will be geared up to bring that technology here. So I, I, it is also true for design services and, our, uh, and the engineering services. So, you know, I'll not generalize by saying designing. And again, uh, see, design is different for different OEMs, depending on, uh, you know, Tata and Mahindra have a different definition of design. They have to do it locally. They may get uh, expats here to support them, right? Uh, Maruti is much evolved. Uh, and suppose, I'm just taking an example to illustrate If Suppose 90% they were dependent initially, probably they are only 20, 30% dependent right now on, on their homeroom. Whereas the companies like, other multinationals who are evolving still, they are dependent on the homeroom for designing capabilities at this point of time. This whole thing is a evolution, you know, so depending on where you come from, um, I think this keeps evolving and people keep learning. So we are at a different stage right now, but on the engineering side, the curve is much faster. I'll draw all three of your uh, attention towards new mobility, that's electric car, uh, multi-fuel and all. Just want to understand, in I say, I asked the previous speaker also the same question. With ICE, we had to follow the technology that was developed by Europe or Japan. In the new mobility landscape, do you think India will have an equal uh, playing field or a level playing field? And how do you see the Indian stakeholder in the mobility, step, uh, uh, mobility space taking shape? Do you think they are equally aggressive and they are focused towards developing uh, their in-house or uh, localized technology, they're doing enough R&D, do you think that? If you're, uh, you're asking about uh, electrification? Uh, I'm asking say, about overall future mobility. Overall future mobility. So, uh, so when you look at, uh, you know, future mobility and the mega trends and what is uh, going to happen uh, from a carbon neutral perspective or from a safety or regulatory perspective or from a customer need of comfort, convenience, uh, connectivity uh, uh, requirements, uh, there is a lot of change which is going to happen. And today we are talking about localization and we are talking about ICE technology, which is already and other technologies which have actually matured and have become uh, uh, kind of become commodities today. Uh, and so, uh, and the the manufacturing uh, eco space has uh, has you know uh, kind of matured and you know is we are competitive. However, when we look at future technologies, where are we today? And when we look at from uh, from the OEM and from the uh, auto component industry and what is available today, next five years, what you are going to see if we are going to look at some of those technologies. I do not see the, the R&D related work or the manufacturing footprint being available today in India in the next five to seven years. 
the question is what do we do in order to meet or how do we you know how can we catch up and that's where we you know always are looking at and how, how do we catch up but having said that there's one portion of the work which i believe india is there today and which is based on software and related to connectivity and some of those other aspects where i think today we are being able to provide services to all parts of the world so i think uh, when we look at electronics we look at battery or we look at some of these chemistries or we look at future technologies of adas i don't think today we do we do not have a manufacturing footprint in india we are totally today uh, dependent on the import and if we have to you know in the next 5 years if the regulatory environment says that we need to go into that we also need to look at the fact that do we have enough time where we are able to localize it and make it affordable for the indian customer to meet that require to to make that make make it a, a a value proposition for the customer and make a difference to the lives of the customer on a day to day basis so i think that's something which we need to look at so i think uh, i i still believe there is a lot of opportunity we need to do certain things in order to make that happen and if we have to you know the 30 years of experience of ice technology of petrol and diesel if we have to you know compress that for electrification and other future technologies in the next 10 years in the in the next decade that's what is going to happen then i think we need a lot of work to do as as a as a group and it's not just oems auto component industry the start of the academic institutions and government everybody needs to work together in order to make it into a proposition which can actually you know bring in the regulation you bring in technology you bring in what is required and from a carbon neutrality perspective i think there's a lot of work which is required to be done but i think it's doable provided we put our heads together and we align the vectors uh before i open the floor for the questions one last question to all of you all three of you do you see the investment trend in r&d changing now so think uh, i would look at it in a different way i think raman san ji spoke about uh, localization there is a regulatory framework which needs investment i am hoping that we have an alignment where it is a uh, not a very hushed up and a hurried up kind of a uh, regulatory framework it is a 5 year 10 year plan where i think then the investments taken place now when i'm an entrepreneur when an investment is being done i think we have to do the cost benefit analysis and see the risk biggest risk is the regulations change so you need a stable plan however for a deep localization it's not just a uh, in, uh, investment in the hardware but you would need in the engineering development capability processes and especially with now the technology changing it you know uh, one small thing i would say the component industry was largely the component manufacturers what you're now seeing and i think you saw in the earlier presenters they're all software guys there are tech guys there are iot guys the cyber security guys who are actually coming in and i think you already have the software so that alignment integration comes in your answer comes in very simple that there would be more dnd and more rnd spend up you want to add quickly yeah so actually uh, uh, environment uh, consumers and the regulators regulations i think they are going to ensure that we keep investing in rnd you know uh, so i mean we can't change that i doubt uh that you know in, uh, there's going to be reduction in r&d uh, in, in fact it's the other way around and that's the challenge to that's the challenge to oems and that's why i think it's very important uh, to have a clear definition of road map that what we what do we want in 10 years i think nobody is going to deny from oem if i can just just generalize and say it on their behalf that yes tell us in the next 10 years what do you want us to do you know but you can't keep changing it every one year uh, you know because it's a huge cost and as raman said i think well because you know if you want to bring a technology i can import a technology and put on the car but this is what do you want to do or you want to really localize it you want to make sure your guys can do it you skill people you skill students uh, you know your your after sales like make thou lakhs of mechanics across the country you know so so it takes time so it has to be well thought through uh, so so i would say uh, and also second thing is that's why globally you are seeing collaboration among among oems 
because you know on one we know all in 20 30 years time you have to invest in evs uh, not invest the environment is going to be ev connected car adas and everything so so i think there is a need for collaboration so more investment and more collaboration this is the key going forward collaboration and long term policy that's what you think it will help uh, raman san uh, your comment then i'll open the floor for question please make mics available and you keep your questions ready we'll open the questions well, i think we're talking about two things one is about you know from a manufacturing standpoint of view and i believe that from a government perspective i think they have put in uh, uh, in in perspective in uh, in uh, you know from a policy perspective the pli scheme for the advanced technologies uh, for manufacturing of uh, parts or systems in india and so there is incentives which are available so which i believe is is a good step and so similarly for advanced chemistry and now for semiconductors also there is a uh, initiative which is happening and so therefore i believe that's a good step but the other thing which i am we are talking about is the research and development and the you know the technology development part of it i think that's where the focus is because you are doing the manufacturing but you need to understand the technology because you need to make it relevant for india and when you have to do that and that's where uh, the r and d focus also needs to be brought in is what i believe and so today you see a lot of the work from a software perspective or from a or from a, even from a digital perspective from a, a simulation perspective a lot of work is happening in india but from uh, the the core uh, you know uh, you know electronics or some of the other areas i think we need to do a lot more is what i believe and uh, uh, we need also need to skill the people accordingly going forward in order to make them uh, enable them to do that so i think uh, yes certain things are happening some more things have to happen so raise your hand we can take one or two questions oh, okay uh, please make the mics available here in the center i would request those who have already asked question in the previous session uh, you can meet them uh, off stage also so we'll take only two three question from here center yeah good afternoon uh, avik chattopadhyay and the question is actually to raman sir but anybody can answer uh, you know we're talking about digital twin virtual validation ai ml software embedded technologies and everything but at the end of the day we are still making the car the same way as we made 80 years back yeah so it's like you know trying new metallurgy for a fixed cannon whereas the world should have moved to field guns so are we actually and and the old way of making cars constrains us from actually making personal mobility flexible and allowing smaller batch productions whether it be body styles or variants and so on so aren't we actually putting new good money behind bad old money <laughs> sorry avik but i disagree with you Uh, that uh, we are making the vehicles the way we were making you know decades ago uh, i believe that uh, uh, a lot of changes happened in the way in which we today manufacture or design cars uh, a lot of digital lot of simulation a lot of work uh, which is happening uh, is happening on the if you have the v cycle for development if you are aware of that the left side of the cycle how much we can go towards that is the in, is the intention and why i say that is what we were producing 30 years back and what we are today as a product is much more complicated has much more com electronic component into it and is is having uh, uh, the complexity is much much higher and the requirements of safety or emission or some of those things are much much more stringent but still we are able to you know try to reduce and keep it in the same life cycle or in the same product cycle we are trying to make sure that we are able to ensure that we give a product which is reliable and durable for the customer i think making sure of that is very very important because today we have a recall code we have you know so many things uh, which are 
uh, which has, there is an onus on the manufacturer to ensure quality and reliability of the product. And that is something which has gone up tremendously. And I'm sure these digital technologies are helping in a way. Now, the second part of the question which you talked about was about personalization and looking at other sorts of other mobility and making uh, products uh, in batch productions or, you know, I think that's, uh, that's uh, we as, you know, auto manufacturers, we like scale, you know, in a way and scale, you know, uh, we, we like to, but uh, having said that, we also look at from a customer point of view that this is, you know, uh, what is the segment we need to go into and all of that. But having said that, if that is a need, that we need to have batch production and we need to have products which are, which, which are customizable or personalizable or some of those things, is definitely I think auto industry will have to do a lot more changes in the supply chain, in the way we manufacture and in the way in which we are actually developing products. So definitely, I think that is definitely required. But uh, whether we have to go towards that and that is the need of the market, yes, that needs to be assessed is what I feel. Hello. So good afternoon, my name is Pradeep and I represent Lab India. My question is like, uh, it's a good initiative that we are all talking about EV implementation in the next few years for its uh, uh, cleaner and sustainable environment. But have we also addressed towards providing the clean energy, let's say for example, charging the stations, where is the energy coming from? Is it from cleanest form of energy production? Number two, have you also determined the cleanest form of disposal of batteries in the future trends? Um, I think this is the question which whole globe is trying to answer right now. It's not only about India. And then we can keep discussing for hours like it's like uh, you're talking about the tailpipe emissions or you're talking about, uh, you know, uh, 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 up to grave. So the thing is, uh, uh, you know, uh, there are a lot of studies have been done in Europe, in America. And they say, okay, if you suppose drive an EV and just measure the tailpipe emission versus an ice or or you take the energy right from the energy productions from where the energy is coming. So every country has a different answer depending on uh, how the energy is produced in that country. You know, but one thing is very clear globally, the trend, uh, most of the countries or other all the countries are moving towards cleaner energy solutions. And everybody has a different number that even in India, India has announced that in two year, 20 years time, the renewable renewable energy portion is going to be much more than uh, the coal and things like that. So, you know, there's a, there is a roadmap drawn by Indian government, like as you have in Europe, like as you have in China or Japan or America, right? So it means the, it means the, uh, the actual emission, uh, you know, is going to be better and better if the energy is also produced from uh, those kind of sources. So that's the trend right now, if you ask, and you just talk about tailpipe emission of a car in a particular country, probably the, and the debate will continue and some guys will say it's not a good idea. But that's the trend. And I think we are on that trend. So that's a good news. The second thing is about the battery disposable. So again, as you probably know, within India, also a lot of companies are trying to get into um, the recycling, the reusage, what's the second life of battery and also disposal, disposable of the battery in a, in a very responsible way. There are companies in India which are doing it. And a lot of research is going on globally. As an example, in MG, we are talking to uh, uh, Terry that can we have a rural electrification opportunity for a used battery, uh, our ZSEV battery, or can we put those batteries into transmission towers? You know, we have successfully cycled 98% of our ZSEV battery through a company called Atiro. Atiro is setting a big disposable plants in India. You know, so, so a lot of work is going on already. And this is again, globally, lots and lots of companies are working and new startups are also coming. So that's the right direction. Uh, it's a, uh, in a evolution which is happening and, and we need to follow that path. Uh, Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, due to uh, lack of time, I'll have to close this panel here. However, the discussion shall continue. You can ask questions off stage. Uh, the speakers will be here for some time at least. Thank you so much, everyone, for lovely questions and being such a nice audience. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Thank you, sir.